A book summary of A Streetcar Named Desire by Audiobook Academy. American playwright Tennessee Williams penned A Streetcar Named Desire in 1947. In the following year, the play won a Pulitzer Prize for Drama and has been hailed as one of the greatest works of the 20th century. In the first run, it starred Jessica Tandy, Marlon Brando, and Carl Malden, as well as a host of other well known names. It's about Blanche Dubois, a woman who moves in with her younger sister Stella in New Orleans' French Quarter after losing her family's home. Stanley, the spouse of Blanche and Stella, has an instant disdain towards him. When Blanche comes from a wealthy family, she thinks of Stanley as harsh and low class, while he thinks of her as prudish and rigid. It becomes clear that Stanley's marriage to Stella has become strained, and that Blanche's sister is often beaten by him. Attempts by Blanche to persuade her sister to break up with her husband fall flat. During this time, Blanche develops a sexual relationship with Stanley's buddy Mitch, a relationship that appears to be sincere. Mitch's newfound love for Blanche is put to the test when Stanley tells him about her prior sexual promiscuity. In an attempt to confront Mitch, Blanche becomes enraged and tipsy. During an altercation, he overpowers her and rapes her. He then beats her to a pulp. In the wake of the assault, Blanche's already fragile mental state began to spiral out of control, and her sister Stella, believing her sister's narrative about the rape, decided to take her to a mental asylum so that she could receive the medical care she needed. When Blanche enters the asylum, she does so uncomplicatedly and without a second thought. The action of the play opens on a rocky corner in the French Quarter of New Orleans. The windows of the building are being yelled at by a man named Stanley Kowalski and a buddy of his named Mitch. Both of them engage in light-hearted conversation before Stanley hands her an envelope of meat and tells her they are going bowling thereafter. Stella joins them as soon as they depart, so she can keep an eye on things. A short time later, another woman shows there. Sister of Stella, she goes by the name of Blanche. She rushes into the building and tells one of Stella's neighbors that she is looking for her, despite seeming out of place and dressed up for the area. We discover from Blanche's conversation with the neighbor that she is a Mississippi-born teacher who usually resides on the family estate, Belrev, when she visits the Kowalskis. Blanche requests to be left alone when Eunice asks her questions. Eunice resolves to go and get Stella when she left. Blanche, alone by herself, surveys her new surroundings with a sour expression. It's not until she comes across some whiskey that she seems to wake up and start enjoying it that we notice anything different. When Stella returns, she gives Blanche a bear hug. When Blanche mistakenly reveals that she believes Stella is no longer in this world, things get awkward between the two. After that, things get dense at the reunion. Blanche tries to change the conversation after she realizes she made a mistake. Stella is happy to oblige. It is Blanche's story that initiates the conversation, and she says that she was forced to take leave from her profession as a teacher due to nerve issues. To ease her fears of not being liked by Stanley. She starts making insulting remarks about his Polish heritage and inferior social status. When Blanche sees Stella's attempt to defend Stanley, she knows that she is clearly in love with him. It is revealed that Belrev, the family house, has been taken over by creditors. She holds Stella responsible for the current state of affairs, pointing the finger at the older sister for their sister's marriage and subsequent move to New Orleans. Stanley happens to be home at the time. At first, Stanley and Blanche are apprehensive but friendly toward each other. A few drams are in short supply in his liquor cabinet, so Blanche is invited to join him. But she declines, claiming that she doesn't drink too much at all herself. Blanche gets offended as Stanley begins to remove his t-shirt in her presence. When he inquires about her marriage, she just says that the boy died and then discloses that she is ill, which catches him off guard. During Blanche's bath time, Stella tells Stanley to be kind to her sister and to keep the pregnancy a secret from her. After the sale of Belarev, Stanley confronts his wife and inquires as to where the proceeds went. That Blanche's fragile emotional state is really an act to cover up the fact that she pocketed all of the selling proceeds seems to be what he thinks, Stanley is enraged by the concept since he believes that the money should have been his, not Stella's. To find the house's selling contract, he starts going through Blanche's things. His friend is coming over to estimate the value of Blanche's clothes because he felt they were costly after seeing them. Stella storms out of the room in rage at his behavior. After Blanche has finished her bath, she closes the drapes leading to the Kowalski's bedroom so she can get dressed. When she tries to alter the topic of conversation by flirting with Stanley, he refuses to do so. Blanche pulls out a package from her trunk and delivers it to Stanley. In spite of this, he finds a second set of papers and decides to peruse them as well. Because the other papers include a love letter from her late spouse that Blanche has saved, this horrifies her insisting that Stanley only look at the papers she hands him. 
he refuses to read anything else. To his surprise, he discovers that Belrev had been seized and not sold as he had previously thought it was. It dawned on him that Blanche had been giving him the truth. It was already in decline when Blanche and her sister were born since the estate had been inadequately managed. Stanley is comforted by Stella's admission and unintentionally tells her that she is pregnant. Stella arrives to the apartment soon after and asks Blanche if she would like to go out to escape Stanley's bodies for a poker game. Stella and Stanley's marriage may be the only way to assure the continuation of the family's upper-class heritage, and Blanche agrees as the two depart. Stanley, Mitch, and two other men are shown playing poker late into the night in the following scene. Mitch, on the other hand, was concerned about whether or not he should return to his sick mother's bedside. There is little interest shown in Blanche and Stella's return from their expedition by most of the guys. Mitch, on the other hand, becomes nervous and uneasy upon meeting her and appears to be attracted to her in general. Unlike the other men, Blanche admits that she likes him as well. When Stella asks the men to stop the game, her husband slaps her bottom with a disrespectful slap. Stella joins Blanche in the other room because she is ashamed of herself. Stella and Blanche begin a conversation in the bedroom. When Blanche switches on a radio, Stanley leaps up and cuts it off, yelling at them to be quiet. When Mitch returns to the room a few minutes later, Blanche is enraged and flirting with him. It's a typical conversation between these two, but it's also one of the more interesting ones. Because of Stella's illness, Blanche claims that she has only come to New Orleans for her younger sister's sake. Blanche returns to dancing with Tim and Mitch shortly after turning the radio back on. When Stanley returns to the room, he storms back in and throws the radio out the window in wrath. By standing up for her sister, Stella provokes Stanley into viciously beating her. Blanche rushes upstairs to Eunice's apartment with Stella's personal belongings while the other men in the room remove him from her. Stella and Blanche are not happy with Stanley's treatment of them. The men try to get Stanley to drink, but when he refuses, they just take their poker money and leave. On the verge of passing out from intoxication, Stanley makes a desperate attempt to reach Eunice's apartment up the hall only to be met with Stella's flat refusal. When Eunice arrives in her window and asks him to stop, he rushes out onto the street and yells for Stella incessantly. Stella bursts through the door and sprints to Stanley's aid. Afterwards, the two embrace and he lifts her into their flat. At Mitch's apartment door, Blanche tries to follow Stella but is stopped by Mitch, who believes that Stanley and Stella are in love and that Blanche has nothing to worry about. When Stella's sister returns the following morning, she finds her blissfully singing in her bed. Blanche is relieved to learn that Stella is okay, but she wonders how she could return to Stanley after he battered her. In reply, Stella says that she loves Stanley and that she is making a big deal out of nothing. She admits that she's learned to put up with Stanley's aggression over the years since she realizes it's just a nasty habit. Astonishment and bewilderment fill Blanche's eyes as she witnesses her sister's lack of concern and cheerfulness. To get her attention, she tells Stella about an old suitor who had got back in touch with her and hit oil and became very wealthy. When she inquires about financing their getaway, she unwittingly reveals her financial predicament to her sister. When Blanche overreacts, Stella thinks she's being ridiculous and laughs. For her part, Stanley swears that she will not quit, despite his outbreaks of aggression and nasty attitude. A relationship shouldn't be formed solely out of sexual desire, according to Blanche. Stanley overhears Blanche telling Stella that she thinks he's a thug and a common chimp in the hallway. Stella rushes to embrace him as soon as he arrives in the apartment. Stanley has a sneer on his face as he watches Blanche. It is not long after this that Blanche contacts Shep Huntley to inquire about visiting him in Dallas with her sister. In the process of doing so, she and Stella witness an argument between Eunice and Steve. Steve beats Eunice when she accuses him of cheating. Eunice hurries out of her flat and vows to call the police. During the uproar, Stanley returns home and inquires of Stella as to what is going on. Steve shows up a short time later with a swollen cheek from what she told him. He inquires as to her whereabouts and, following advice, sets out to find her. For some time, Blanche and Stanley trade barbs in the Kowalski's apartment, until Stanley lets her know about his research into her past and asks whether she knows someone named Shaw. Blanche falters as she denies ever meeting somebody with such name. Blanche a filthy hotel in Mississippi, where Blanche grew up is where Stanley claims Shaw frequently visits and asserts she was a regular customer there. The claims against Blanche are false, she says. Outside, Steve and Eunice are cheerfully strolling back to their apartment after they've reconciled once more in the open air. Blanche will not rest until Stanley returns and tells her what the town has been saying about her. To which Stella replies, I know what you're talking about, but I'd want to offer you a Coke. Stella complies with Blanche's request for an alcoholic beverage. 
Blanche, in a fit of hysteria, reveals that she is leaving as soon as possible because she believes Stanley will expel her. Her date with Mitch that night is the only thing making Blanche irrationally irate, she tells herself. Stella gives her the reassurance she needs before heading to the bar to meet her husband. Blanche is all by herself in the flat as she awaits Mitch's arrival. Blanche flirts with a young man who comes to the door to collect money for newspaper delivery and kisses him on the lips. The young man's nervousness and discomfort are clearly evident. Blanche chastises herself and says that she must be good and remember to keep her hands off of youngsters, hinting that she was fired from her teaching profession for a far more serious reason than she has previously stated. Mitch shows up not long after and the two go on a date. They return to the Kowalski's flat around 2 a.m., weary. It is Blanche's fault that she was not able to fully enjoy herself at her sister's place. She also admitted that she will be moving out shortly. Upon Mitch's request, she informs him that he doesn't need to ask if he can kiss her goodbye. After joking around, Blanche invites Mitch over for a drink at night. However, as the conversation progresses, Blanche divulges more personal information about her ex-husband. It was when she was 16 years old that she met the man and fell in love with him, but she always believed he was haunted by some deep-seated issue. When she returned home one day, he was having an affair with another man. She and her husband tried to disregard the occurrence, but after Blanche stated in a drunken stupor that she thought her young spouse repulsive, the young man took his own life as a result of his own actions. He concedes that they both need the other, and Blanche is comforted by Mitch's words. They embrace each other. There's a time jump of a few weeks in the play. While Blanche is taking a bath, Stella is preparing the apartment for her birthday. Stanley enters and mocks Blanche's propensity of bathing for long periods of time. Blanche's younger sister, Stella, tries to defend her, but Stanley tells her that he's learned something new about her. Laurel, Mississippi, is the sister's hometown, and Stanley tells his wife that he works with a man who frequently visits. According to Shaw, Blanche's reputation has been tarnished since she has been staying at an unsavory motel. It wasn't long before she was asked to leave by the motel since her actions was deemed morally unacceptable. After it was discovered that she had a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old kid, she was sacked from her teaching position in the town. According to Stanley, Blanche is just living with them because she has no other place to go and has no plans to travel back to their hometown with them anytime soon. After listening to her husband's stories, Stella is skeptical arguing that Blanche does have issues but they are a product of her broken marriage. Stanley confesses to Mitch that he has told him the truth about Blanche and that the other man most likely won't be attending the party. Astonished and disgusted, Stella reacts. Her husband then informs Blanche that he has purchased a bus ticket to return to Laurel as a birthday present. The atmosphere is depressing following Blanche's birthday supper. As a result, the table is still without Mitch. Stanley and Blanche get into a confrontation again and this time Stanley damages a few plates before storming the porch. The Kowalski's gift of a bus ticket home further dampens the atmosphere. Blanche bursts into tears as she rushes to the bathroom. Stanley declares that he plans to go bowling in celebration of his recent success. Angry with her husband's treatment of Blanche, Stella lashes out at him and demands to know why. After arguing with her, Stanley observes a change in Stella's demeanor. She's suddenly ill and wants to be transported to the hospital, so the driver takes her. Kindly. Stanley helps her out of the door. Blanche drinks alone in the bedroom later that night. Mitch, who is also inebriated, rings the doorbell, and she answers it to find him there. In response to Mitch's gloomy demeanor, Blanche begins to ramble about her late spouse and the birthday supper she had planned for him. At last, Mitch reveals that he was duped by Blanche's pretense of morality and antiquity the entire summer. He claims to have heard stories about Blanche's history from three separate men, but she denies it. That is until she breaks down and says that the stories are true, but that Mitch gives her hope for the future. Blanche goes into a fit of hysteria, blathering on and on about her past, her mother, and how she has returned home. In an effort to comfort her, Mitch grabs her and tells her that he still loves her but he can't marry her since she can't live with his mother. Blanche screams and sobs at him to leave. She screams fire. Out of the window when he doesn't respond. Blanche is devastated when Mitch rushes out the door. Stanley will be home later and he will be inebriated as well. The baby won't be born until the next day at the earliest, he says Blanche. Hep Huntley has sent Blanche a telegram and wants her to join him on his yacht in the Caribbean, she tells Stanley. Until Blanche starts talking about Shep and how her talents and breeding have been wasted in the flat with the Kowalskis, Stanley is in a pleasant frame of mind. Stanley's temper flares up once more, and he demands that she declare that the telegram from Shep is a forgery. In the meantime, 
Blanche grows increasingly agitated as she waits for him to emerge from the restroom. She tries to contact the operator to obtain aid, but Stanley emerges from the restroom before she can get a hold of an operator. Stanley has cornered Blanche and is approaching her menacingly. Despite her pleas for him to back off, he continues to inch closer to her. Her weapon of choice is a bottle that she breaks on the table. He pushes her to drop the bottle by grabbing her arms. He drags her to the bedroom and rapes her without much difficulty. Stella, a few weeks after Blanche's death, is inconsolable as she collects her stuff. Stanley and his friends are playing cards again while Blanche takes a bath. Eunice walks into the apartment and starts helping Stella pack. The infant, which she has been babysitting, is now asleep, she tells Stella. Later, Stella explains to Eunice that they are sending Blanche to the country for a little break, but that Blanche is mistakenly believing that she will be sailing with Shep Huntley while she is away. While she isn't sure if what she did was the best thing for her sister, Blanche claims that Stanley raped her and she just does not believe her. It is evident Blanche is unhinged when she comes from the bathroom and is comforted by the women. When Mitch hears her speaking in the next room, he immediately goes into a frown. Blanche breaks out in fits of laughter when Stanley yells at him to keep his mind on the task at hand. The women try to calm her down. Blanche expects that Shep is at the door when the doorbell rings. It's a doctor and a nurse, in reality. When Blanche exits the room and moves into the adjacent one, the other poker players all rise to their feet and salute her. With the exception of Mitch, who is confined to a mute look at the dining room table. Blanche retreats to her apartment when she realizes that the guy who has come to get her is a doctor, rather than Shep. Blanche needs to be rescued by the nurse, according to the doctor. They are at odds with one another. Feeling betrayed, Stella seeks consolation from Eunice, who joins her on the porch to console her. To keep Mitch from reaching Blanche, Stanley keeps him from entering the room. Stanley pushes back on Mitch's attempt to hit him. Blanche is being released by the doctor, who is speaking quietly to her. Blanche tells him, I have always relied on the compassion of strangers, whatever you are. Blanche is led from the apartment by the doctor, and she does not look back to say goodbye to her sister. Eunice returns with her newborn baby to Stella before going to the flat to see the guys. Stella, who is cradling her sobbing infant, is comforted by Stanley's presence. He speaks softly to reassure her. Blanche Dubois, when the play starts, Blanche is already a fallen woman in the eyes of the public. Because of her indiscreet sexual behavior, she has become an outcast in society. Her family's riches and estate are gone. Her young spouse committed suicide years earlier. As a result, she has a terrible drinking problem that she hides shamelessly. Social grandeur and sexual morality mask Blanche's fragile, isolated personality. She is a seasoned former beauty queen who lives in constant fear of losing her once-in-a-lifetime brilliance. She is little and slender, and she flaunts a wardrobe of showy but low-quality clothing. Stanley is able to see through Blanche's facade and begins digging into her background. Blanche Kowalski is regarded as a lady without blemish in the Kowalski household. False respectability is more than simply gaudiness for her, it's a calculated effort to attract fresh male suitors to herself. Blanche's only hope of escaping poverty and the dreadful infamy that follows her around is to find a husband. Sadly, Blanche has lost all faith in love because the southern gentleman she thought would save her is no longer around. She believes Mitch is her best chance at happiness, even though she has to put up with him being so far away from her ideal partner. Blanche's quest for Mitch is thwarted by Stanley's persistent abuse of her, as are her attempts to shelter herself from the cruel realities of her situation. Blanche's mental health decline is depicted throughout the play. Blanche is finally taken out by Stanley, who brutally assaults her and then commits her to an asylum, destroying the rest of her sexual and mental well-being. Blanche finally relents to a gentle doctor's pull oblivious to her sister's cries. This final moment is the terrible climax of Blanche's vanity and reliance on men for happiness. Stanley Kowalski, Stanley is an interesting character because of his many facets of personality. Stella is the love of his life, but he treats her horribly. Even though he despises Blanche, he will occasionally be cordial to her. Stanley was almost a hero in the beginning of the play, before the first poker night incident. Blanche refers to Stanley as a Pollock multiple times in the play and he expresses his displeasure. A part of Stanley's psyche is affected by his distaste of the idea that he is viewed as uneducated or of poor social standing. Stanley's disdain for Blanche is mostly a result of her judgment of him as unexceptional and unbred. For Stanley, a new, homogeneous picture of American society exists, while Blanche's class represents the past and represents the old guard. He sees himself as the next step in development, 
and he casually mentions that he believes he saved Stella's life by removing her from her home and lowering her to his level of existence. When he's not being a complete monster, Stanley's character may be downright comically impolite. For raping Blanche and hitting his wife, he seems to have no remorse. All of this is done, it would appear, in order to keep the ladies in check. In the play's last scene, we see Stanley as a loving husband and father comforting his wife and new baby. Because this is so out of character with what we've seen so far, it can be called a disguise. Stella Kowalski, Stella is Blanche's younger sister and a former social woman who now resides with her slovenly husband in the worst part of town. In spite of how far she's fallen, Stella may yet be better off than Blanche was in the beginning because she still has a place to call home. Because of her violent husband's erratic behavior, Stella has become a reclusive, silent woman. She seems to care deeply for both her husband and her sister, despite the fact that they don't usually get along and have nothing in common. A fair compensation for the way he treats her, in Stella's mind, is their passionate physical relationship. An example of an abused spouse, she has been brainwashed to the point where she no longer believes her husband is capable of wrongdoing, despite the fact that she routinely witnesses him engaging in such behavior. Even though she doesn't believe Stanley raped Blanche, Eunice learns from her that she can't continue to live with him because of her belief in Stanley's guilt over Blanche's sexual assault. As a woman in the early 20th century with a new baby, she has few other options even if she chooses to leave him, and we are offered a glimpse of the damage his abuse has done to her life. Mitch, Harold Mitch Mitchell, is one of Stanley's closest buddies. His cool, rational demeanor contrasts nicely with Stanley's irrationality for the most part of the play. Even if the other players in the poker game make fun of him, we see right away that he is a gentleman right from the start. When Mitch's mother is nearing the end of her life, he hopes to find a wife for himself before she goes away. When it comes to Blanche's attraction to him, it's more a product of her desperate desire for male attention. Unlike Blanche's vision of a sophisticated southern gentleman, Mitch exhibits all of these characteristics in his everyday interactions with her. Both Blanche and Mitch have had difficult childhoods, and they are drawn to one another because of this. Even though Mitch still cares for Blanche, he can't let her live with his biological mother because of Blanche's past sexual promiscuity. Mitch is clearly troubled by Blanche's collapse and transfer to an asylum at the play's conclusion. It is only after hearing her struggle with the nurse and standing down to Stanley that he makes an attempt to help her. American writer Tennessee Williams is considered one of the greatest dramatists of the 20th century. Williams was born John Lanier Williams in 1911 in Columbus, Mississippi. He was born and raised in St. Louis. In 1938, he graduated with a B.A. in history from the University of Missouri and Washington University. The Glass Menagerie was written by him in 1945 and made his Broadway debut that same year. The New York Drama Critics Circle named this moving memory drama their favorite of the season. A Streetcar Named Desire, 1947, Williams' first Pulitzer Prize for Drama, has been hailed as the greatest American play of all time. He received yet another Pulitzer for his work on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof shortly thereafter, 1954. In all three of these plays, Williams used lyrical language, symbolism, and original characters. Every one of them is also located in the American South, which the author took advantage of in order to create a sensual, nostalgic, and decadent blend unlike anything else. After William came out as gay in the 1930s, he became part of a select group of New York's gay intellectuals. Although Williams was a huge success, he was also an alcoholic and drug abuser. As his fame waned in the 1960s and 1970s, he spiraled deeper into depression. After the death of his longtime boyfriend, Frank Marlowe in 1963, Williams became depressed and went to a number of rehabs and treatment clinics. In this period, the majority of his plays were regarded as failures by the critics. Only 40 performances were given to his final piece, A House Not Meant to Stand, which was staged in 1982. 71-year-old Williams was found dead at a New York hotel in 1983. Coroner's initial report said that he choked on the cap of an eyedrop container that he had been taking, but was later revised to include that his heavy drug and alcohol consumption most likely led to his death by suppressing his gag reflex. Williams' remaining family members arranged for his burial in St. Louis. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this, see you in next video.